we will discuss state of hemoglobin in both intravascular and extravascular hemolysis. Now first let's consider extravascular hemolysis. Loss of deformability of red cell membrane leads to its breakdown in spleen and macrophages phagocytize these red cells. They also separate it into its components. So what are these components? So these are lipids, proteins and uh, hemoglobin. Well, hemoglobin is also a protein but uh, because it has its separate catabolic pathway, so we are keeping it as separate. Anyways, hemoglobin is further broken down to heme and globin and this globin joins this protein catabolic pathway. So each of these enter its own catabolic pathways. Proteins are catabolized to amino acid and join amino acid pool of body while lipid also are catabolized further. Now while here we will talk in detail about catabolism of heme only. Now macrophages further catabolize heme to bilirubin. Uh, this is done by an enzyme present in the macrophages known as heme oxygenase and in this process iron is released from the heme and it joins its iron pool which can be reused also oxygen is required see this is oxygenase and carbon monoxide is produced as one of the metabolic end product and this is the only known metabolic reaction where carbon monoxide is formed now this biliverdin is further reduced to bilirubin bilirubin is released into the circulation now in intravascular hemolysis Hemoglobin is not captured by macrophages and it is directly released into the circulation. This hemoglobin which is released binds with a protein known as haptoglobin which is present in the plasma and this binding is reversible. This complex of hemoglobin and haptoglobin enters liver where hemoglobin meets the same fate as that of splenic macrophages. So finally, bilirubin is formed from hemoglobin haptoglobin complex which enters the liver. Now this uh, bilirubin is the end product of catabolism of heme and it needs to be excreted. So we'll see excretion of bilirubin. Now since bilirubin is water insoluble, it can be transported in circulation only in combination with the water soluble substance. So bilirubin after being released into the circulation binds with albumin. Now whenever a substance is transported by binding with the protein, they bind reversibly and loosely. Bilirubin and albumin binding also behaves in the same way. When this complex reaches liver, Bilirubin gets separated from albumin and enters liver by a process of facilitated diffusion. So what is happening at the level of hepatocytes? So the, here is the blood vessel and this complex enter into the blood vessel and is taken up at the level of the hepatocytes by facilitated diffusion. Now since it's a diffusion, it is important that intracellular bilirubin concentration is kept low and back diffusion of bilirubin is prevented. So inside the liver cells, bilirubin binds to another protein known as ligandin. Ligandin prevents its back diffusion into the blood. Also, further metabolism of bilirubin ensures that intracellular bilirubin concentration is kept low. Now, what happens in these hepatocytes? So, let me draw a big hepatocyte. So, once bilirubin enters via facilitated diffusion, it binds with ligandin. Now, this bilirubin then combines with glucuronic acid in presence of an enzyme that is glucuronyl transferase and forms bilirubin diglucuronide. Now this is also known as conjugated bilirubin because it has been conjugated to a substance. Finally, conjugated bilirubin is excreted into bile. So this side is bile, here it is blood. Uh, bilirubin is excreted into bile by an active transport process requiring energy. So it's important to remember this is active transport and uh, to facilitate it, diffusion to continue, bilirubin should bind with glucuronic acid and should be excreted. Otherwise, it will build up inside the hepatocytes. And further, bilirubin cannot enter into the cells and will not be able to be excreted. Now, once we know the fate of hemoglobin, we can actually utilize the process for understanding the mechanism of diseases and also in determination of some clinical parameters. For example, in uh, extravascular hemolysis, 
analysis, we saw that carbon monoxide is produced in this reaction and it is the only reaction in the body in which carbon monoxide is produced. So, by determining carbon monoxide production, we can actually determine the rate of breakdown of hemoglobin and thus rate of breakdown of RBCs. Second, you see that if intravascular hemolysis increases, which happens in some diseases, the plasma haptoglobin will be consumed in binding to hemoglobin and any excess hemoglobin will start appearing in urine and may also precipitate in kidneys. Normally, hemoglobin can't appear in urine since it's bound to a protein and their combined size is large enough to not filter in urine. Next, we'll see in uh, another lecture on jaundice where uh, any problem in uh, conjugation or excretion of the bilirubin or if uh, too much uh, bilirubin is formed, how it can lead to a jaundice.